Okay, good morning, everybody. Before we start on the uh, lecture, or I guess the review, um, I want to really quickly talk about the rest of the semester. So we really just have, your exam is on Monday, and then we will have material, new material, on the 18th and on the 20th. And we are supposed to have an in-person class on Monday the 23rd. So that's the week of Thanksgiving. Um, I'm not really sure what I want to do about that um, because I'm not actually going to have any new material. So if we were to meet in person, it would really just be more of like a review session in terms of review for your final, which would be like two or three weeks away. Um, so I guess my question is, do you guys want to have an in-person class on that day, or would you guys prefer to me to put up some kind of like asynchronous material on the YouTube channel? I'm not with asynchronous. Okay, votes for asynchronous. Any votes for synchronous? Live and in-person? Okay, I kind of thought that people would want to be going home a little early or something like that. So we'll, we'll have an asynchronous class day that day. I'm not allowed to actually cancel class, but I'm going to make it asynchronous. OK, cool. So uh, I think we were going to do some practice today. So. Do you guys have questions? Yeah. I was looking at Sunday at 5 o'clock. I'm having my two hour uh, test review session. I'm going to send out an email, but Sunday at 5 o'clock. Okay, so the day before the exam, that's Sunday, November 15th. Aaron's going to be having an extra long review session. Um, so make sure to tune in for that. Okay, questions about the exam? Let's have Mia first. I was going to ask a homework question. A homework question? Okay, got to, or Emily? Um, I have a question. Am I allowed to ask a question about the practice test? Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so why, why, don't we, why don't we go for the practice problem first and then we'll go to the homework? Okay, uh, so which problem was it? Mm -hmm. And I did it with like x equals, and I'm doing something wrong. I can't figure out what. Okay. So let's see. Hopefully, I didn't make a mistake. It's very possible. So u squared du, and we go from ln of 1, which is 0, to ln of e, which is 1. Okay, I'm pretty sure I did my part right. So let's move all of this over, and we'll, we'll do method two. Okay, so um, <clears throat> for this problem here, we have the integral of ln of x quantity squared divided by x dx. And this looks far too complicated for us to find an antiderivative using ordinary techniques. So we're going to need to use the one and only method that we know how to take care of things, which are more complicated than that, which is u substitution. So the thing that we should look for first is some function u um, and some something that looks like the derivative of that function, both present in the integrand. And if I split it up like how I've split it up in this red thing here, uh, then I can see that if I take ln of x and I square it and then I multiply by 1 over x, well, 1 over x looks like the derivative of the thing which is inside those parentheses there. So that's sort of good news for our u substitution. So the way I'm going to do this is by picking u to be equal to ln of x. 
And then once I've picked u, du is just going to fall into place. Well, du will be 1 over x dx. That's the derivative of ln times dx. OK. Uh, so now we're going to replace this, and we're going to use method 2. So we'll write the integral from x equals 1 to x equals e of we replace ln of x by u. We still have to square it. So we have u squared du. And now we'll go ahead and do the antiderivative. It'll become u cubed over 3. And we're going to evaluate at x equals 1 and x equals e. Now, we should be very careful not to plug in these x values into u. Okay, because these are x values, and u is itself a function of x. So we have to be a little bit careful. What we should do first, if we're going to use this method, is switch u back to being ln of x. So we should write ln of x cubed divided by 3 evaluated at 1 and e. Okay, so now what we should do is, since these are x values, e and 1, we're going to plug them in to x in this ln function. So we'll get ln of e cubed over 3. And we'll subtract from that ln of 1 cubed over 3. Now, ln of e is the number is the number y such that y is ln of e. That means that if we take both sides to the e power, we would get e to the y on the left-hand side and just an e to the ln of e on the right-hand side. The e and the ln cancel out. We would get e to the y equals e. So y is equal to 1. Um, or you can just realize really from the very first step that ln and e cancel each other out. So if we take ln of e to some power, we just get the power. That's just going to be equal to 1. OK, so all told, this winds up being equal to the number 1. We cube that number, divide by 3, subtract. ln of 1 is 0. So we get 0 over 3, 0 cubed over 3, and we get 1 third. Aha, uh -huh, I see why. OK, so what I think is you're mixing up is what we should have here is, OK, um, are you square up to here? Yeah. You cubed over 3? OK, so here's what we really need to be doing. We need to take u and change it back to being in terms of x, right? So what I do is I take this u and I replace it by the thing which u is equal to. I know that u is equal to ln of x. So I replace u by the function ln of x. But I consider this as an entire function getting cubed. OK? So what I should do if I, were go if I was going to evaluate ln of e cubed, what I should do is take the natural log of e first and then take that number and cube it. I think what you're getting a little bit mixed up on is the reason you're getting 3 is for some reason this 3 somehow made it inside the parentheses. And it's true that if you did ln of e cubed, that would be equal to 3. However, ln of e cubed is 1. Any other questions about that? OK. Mia, you want to ask your homework question? Yeah. It's about 5.5. It's question 4. OK. 
Um, yeah, sure, actually, that, that would work. I can take a look at it. Okay, so let's see if I can faithfully recreate this or something similar. And we have some graph here. P prime of T. And uh, let's say this is point one, this is point two, and this is point three. And this is uh, rate of growth in millions per year. We're asked estimate the change in population. between 1970 and 1990. Okay, thank you, you can take this back now. Okay, so what do we have here? We have some graph of P prime of T, which measures the rate of change of the population. Uh, so we have a rate of change of a quantity, and we're asked a question about the total change in that quantity over a certain time period. Okay. Well, we have one result uh, which tells us something related to this. We said that if, uh, if f of t is a rate of change of a quantity, then integral from a to b of f of t dt is the total change in that quantity from the time when t is equal to a to the time when t is equal to b. So this is the crucial piece of information that we're going to need to use for this problem. So in our case, we do have a rate of growth here. And what we should be a little bit careful about is that the rate of growth is given to us in millions per year. And we should be careful because the width of each interval here is not one year but five years, okay? So we have to be a little bit careful about the way we're going to uh, accumulate area under the curve. Um, so you can probably guess that this is gonna be a box counting problem um, just from looking at it. So let's count some boxes. What we're really interested in is the total change in the population between 1970 and 1990. I see that P prime of T is the rate of change of the population. So I'm interested in the total change in the population, so I should integrate this. So what I'm really wanting to do here is the integral from 1970 to 1990 of P prime of T dt. Now, I also know that this is going to be equal to the area under P prime of T from 1970 to 1990. Okay, so that's the way I'm going to actually compute it. 
So what I should do is take some, uh, like if I take, let's figure out first what are the units going to be of this integral. Well, p prime of t is millions of people per year. And t is measured in years. So if I take the units and multiply together, I will get millions of people per year and multiply by some number of years. And we're going to cancel these guys, and we're going to get millions of people. Which means that when I multiply this length here, which is millions of people per year, 0.1, I guess, 0.1 millions of people per year. Uh, and then this length here, I need to be careful, it should be five years. Okay, so the area of one box is going to be, so area of one box, since each box is 0.1 million people per year high, we get 0.1 mil per year. And we multiply that times five years. The area will be 0.1 mil people per year times five years. We cancel the years and we get 0.5 million people. So each box here is representing half a million people. So let's now just count boxes and multiply times that number. I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, um, these 3 make 9, 10, and then 0.2. So I have a total of 10.2 boxes. Each box represents half a million people. Per box. So I'll wind up with um, half of 10.2 is 5.1 million people. Okay, so they love doing these types of problems in this book for some reason where they give you units which don't match up on the horizontal and vertical axis and you have to be a little bit clever. Uh, there was a problem like this on the practice exam where, or I think it was on the practice exam. Let me check. Oh, I was just in the practice exam. Yeah, there was a problem like this on the practice exam where they gave us uh, the speed of the driver in miles per hour, uh, but they gave us how long the driver drove at, at different speeds in terms of how many minutes they drove at that speed. So we had to make sure that we remember that a minute is 1 60th of an hour. If you want to see the solution to that problem, check out the YouTube video. Okay, have I fully answered your question? Yeah. All right, other questions? Alice? I had a question on number 24 somewhere. Okay, you want to show me or read it to me? I can read it to you. Okay. Okay, so it's the integral of y squared times, and then in parentheses, 11 plus y, and not the same squared. And 
and uh, just the indefinite integral? Yes. Okay. So here's a problem where we want to do this integral here. Uh, and the way it's set up, it almost looks like it is going to be a u-substitution problem. So we see this thing in the parentheses, and then we see stuff outside of the parentheses. Uh, but if we try to use u-substitution for this problem, we're going to run into a problem real fast. Um, does anybody see what the problem is? If I were to pick u to be equal to 11 plus y, what's the problem? Is there an issue? Yeah? Kevin? Not quite, but the issue, remember, if we, if we choose something to be u and we replace it by u, well, we'd be left with something like, you know, integral of u squared, and then we'd have y squared dy. That would be the leftovers. The issue is that the leftovers are not going to match up with du, which is just going to be dy. And there's not going to be a way to solve the right-hand side of this equation to look like our leftovers y squared dy. That's the real issue here, why we can't use u substitution. Was it your first instinct to try to use u substitution? OK. Yeah, that makes sense, because this, this is kind of like a trick question that's, that's posed in a way which looks like it should be u substitution friendly, but it's not. So we need to think of something else we can do. We know we can't use u substitution, or at least we can't choose 11 plus y to be du, or uh, we can't choose 11 plus y to be u, that is. So we need to use a different method. And it's, it might be simpler than you think. This is an integrand, but inside the integral, I can do whatever I want to the stuff that's in here. So I'm just going to simplify a little bit by foiling that out. I'm going to write this. This is the same thing as doing the integral of y squared times 11 squared plus 22y plus y squared dy. And I'm going to distribute that y squared. I'll get the integral of 121y squared plus 22y cubed plus y to the power 4. OK, nothing stopping me from foiling. And now this looks a lot more friendly, because each piece of this sum here is just a power of y. Just a power of y. So we're going to just do the integral of each piece individually. And then we'll add c and we'll be done. So the antiderivative of 121y squared, remember we're taking the antiderivative here with respect to y. We have a dy here, which means that we're treating this as our variable of integration. So the power is going to go up by 1. We'll have 121y cubed divided by 3 plus 22y cubed divided by 4 plus y to the power 5 divide, oh, sorry, that should have been a power 4, y to the power 4 divided by 4, and then y to the power 5 divided by 5 plus c. OK, answered to your satisfaction. Any other questions about how we did this problem? OK, so yeah, this is a situation where it's, it's kind of like we don't need a weapon quite as powerful as u substitution to do this problem. A lot of the time, you can save yourself some work by rearranging the integrand a little bit. In our case, we foiled and distributed. Um, and that's one way that you can 
take care of these problems without having to use U substitution. In fact, even if this was a U substitution friendly problem, like for example, 2y times 11 minus y squared squared, that would be much more U substitution friendly because we could choose 11 minus y squared as U and then du would be 2y dy. I still don't really necessarily have to use this u substitution technique here. I could FOIL out again and I'd wind up with something like, well, two, oh shoot. Oh no, I did that right. Yeah, I'd wind up with something like 121, No, 242y. I should have been a plus. What am I doing? Um, plus the 22y would become 44 y squared plus y cubed. Okay, that took me forever. Um, but yeah, this would this would just be what we would get if we were to foil this out. In fact, god dang it, this would be a fifth power, wouldn't it? No, it'd be a third power. If I switched the problem up. And this would be the fifth. And there'd be a two. So yeah, we don't necessarily have to use U substitution. Um, if you want to go ahead and FOIL something out, then that's great. Um, when it's not really so convenient is if you have a problem like this one here. So if you have a problem where you want to do the integral of some function to like the 21st power, it's not really that convenient to FOIL that 21 times and then multiply everything times 3x squared. Um, so, choose your battles in terms of u-substitution. Okay, um, more questions? Yeah? Okay. All right, so we have some table here and some values of um, Q and C prime of Q. You know, zero, 100, 200, 300, 400. 500 and 600. C prime of Q is 24, 2016, 18, 27, 36, 44. And it says fixed cost is $17. No, seventeen thousand dollars, and we're supposed to estimate total cost of producing four hundred units. Okay. And then that's part A. And then part B says, how much would the total cost increase if production were increased one unit?
Okay, I think I got everything. All right, so what do we got? We got a problem where we are given C prime of Q, that's the marginal cost. In other words, the rate of change of the cost. And we're asked a question about the cost as a quantity. So we should be thinking integration already because we are given a rate of change of a quantity and we're asked to give some kind of information about the quantity itself. Okay, so another thing that we should be a little bit careful of here is that C prime of Q is given in terms of cost per unit and our intervals here are intervals of 100 units. Okay, that's another thing we should be a little bit careful of. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So... How do I want to answer this? Maybe really quickly before I really get to answering the question, I will talk about something really quickly. So remember, let's talk about fixed cost and variable cost. Remember, we had a cost function. So remember way back to like the first month of this class, we said that the cost function C of Q is going to be equal to, um, why don't we call it little, why don't we call it MQ plus B? Uh, actually, we really, we shouldn't call that, call it that. Why don't I call it V of Q plus B? Okay, so this left-hand side is the cost, total cost, to produce um, Q units. And the cost that to produce Q units is going to be our variable cost, which is the component of the cost function which depends on Q. Um, when we initially talked about variable cost, it was always a linear term. Um, now that we've kind of expanded our understanding of cost functions to include those which are more curvy or weird, we should write this function v of q. Uh, I just chose v for variable, variable cost. Um, and then we have our fixed cost, b. And what I want to explain really briefly is that if we take the derivative of both sides, When we do the derivative on both sides, we will get c prime of q on this side. And on the right hand side, we will get v prime of q. Plus zero. Because b is just some constant. It's the fixed cost. In our case, it's $17,000. OK. So what c prime of q is really describing is the rate of change of the variable cost. Okay, the rate of change of the variable cost. That's what C prime of Q is really describing here. Okay, so If I were to integrate v prime of q from a to b, what would this give us? This would give us the, well, v prime of q is the rate of change of the variable cost. This would give us the total change in variable cost from a to b. Okay, total change in variable cost from A to B. So, if we wanted to know, if we knew what C of A, well, why don't we say, if we know 
what v of a is, then we know that the integral from a to b of v prime of q dq is equal to v of b minus v of a. So we can find out what v of b is by taking v of a and adding the integral from a to b of v prime of q dq. So this gives us the variable cost at b. Okay, the variable cost at time or at quantity b. If I were to add to this 17,000 and add to the right hand side 17,000, I would get C of B equals V of A plus the integral from A to B of V prime of Q dQ plus 17,000. Okay, because if I take my variable cost at a given point and I add to that my fixed cost, well, my fixed cost never changes. So if I take the fixed cost and add the variable cost, I get the total cost. Okay, so this is kind of the, the game that we are going to play here. Um, and you'll notice that I kind of put in this little condition here if, if we know what V of A is. So that's a little bit crucial. But it turns out that we are going to know what V of A is in our case because we are going to integrate from 0 to 400. When we integrate from 0 to 400, we are going to know what the variable cost is of producing zero units. How much does it cost me to buy the supplies to produce zero units? Kevin? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Right? I have to pay for the factory rent or whatever, but the um, supplies to buy to produce the actual units aren't going to cost me anything if I'm making zero units. So in particular, this if we know what V of A is condition is going to be met. Okay, so this is the tricky part of this problem is that C prime of Q is really only telling us how the variable cost is changing. And we need to do a little bit of interpretation to remember that the fixed cost is just not going to change. It's fixed, right? So if we take the fixed cost and we add to the fixed cost the sort of accumulation of variable cost, then we're going to get the total cost at some later time. OK, so graphically, maybe I should draw a picture of what the hell I'm talking about. So say we have some cost function here. This is my fixed cost, 17k. And this is C of Q. So this is B. Then I know that the integral from 0 to b of, why don't we just make b 400? 0 to 400 of c prime of q, that will be equal to c of b minus a c of 400 minus c of 0. OK, and I'm interested in knowing what this is c of 400, OK? And I know what c of 0 is. It's just the fixed cost. And I can estimate the integral from 0 to 400 of c prime of q using this table. 
Okay, so this is a bit of a complicated problem. Let me pause for a second before I actually go and solve it and ask if there's questions about this uh, kind of theory that I've been talking about. Yeah? So then are you supposed to use the subtraction equation like in general? The subtraction equation by which you mean the fundamental theorem of calculus? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So th this part here? Yeah. So yeah, it takes a little bit of uh, creativity maybe or or nuanced understanding of, uh, of of what's really going on here so here's how I knew to use it I look at this table and I see what I see information about the number of units being produced and I see information about how the cost is changing I'm asked to give some information about the cost of producing 400 units so really what I'm interested in finding out is what is C of 400? Now I don't really have a good way of computing C of 400 with the information that I have. So what I have to do is involve it in some equation and hope beyond all hope that I know how to compute the other components of the equation. And I know that C of 400 will be part of the equation if I were to take the integral of C prime of Q from 0 to 400, then C of 400 will be on the right-hand side. And now I can kind of work on figuring out what is C of 0 and what is this thing. And if I know those two things, then I can figure out what C of 400 is. So that's how I knew to involve the fundamental theorem of calculus was it was just because I needed to know this thing. And I can only really think of one equation that involves that uh, quantity of interest, I guess. Does that make sense? That might not be that satisfying. Uh, but. It's, it's something that uh, comes with some practice with these problems. Fundamental theorem is, is always, should always be bouncing around in your head. Okay, um, so I've really made a mess of my work area here. I guess I really better move this thing down further. <laughs> okay, so what do we want to do? We want to really say, so let's actually solve. We want C of 400. We know Integral from 0 to 400 of C prime of Q dQ equals C of 400 minus C of 0. C of 0 is just going to be the fixed cost. So I know that this is actually equal to C of 400 minus 17,000. So C of 400 is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 400, C prime of Q, dQ, plus 17,000. And now let's focus on estimating C prime of Q, the integral from 0 to 400 of C prime of Q, dQ. And I'm going to use a left-hand Riemann sum. You could use a right-hand if you want. Okay, let me copy this table actually and, and bring it down. So 
So, what I'm going to do is take this to be my first interval, this to be my second interval, this to be my third interval, and this to be my fourth interval. I'm going to use a left-hand Riemann sum, so I'm going to take the height of the function on the left side of each interval. and multiply by the width of the interval. So I'm going to say that the integral from 0 to 400 of c prime of q dq is going to be approximately equal to now we got to be a little bit careful here we should take 24 what are the units on C prime in the problem? Do you know? I didn't, give didn't give units. Okay. Well, C prime of Q is going to be 24 times, that's the height of the function on the left hand side of the interval, times the width of the interval is 100. And we'll add to that 20 times 100. And we'll add to that 16 times 100. And we'll add to that. 18 times 100. Okay. And then we add all that up and we'll get some number. Um, so then if we take, say that this number is equal to A, then we know that C of 400 is going to be equal to A plus 17,000. approximately equal to. Okay. If we had instead used a Riemann sum, a right Riemann sum, then we would have said that the integral from 0 to 400 of C prime of Q dq is approximately equal to, we would have used the thing on the right side of each interval to estimate. So we would have gotten uh, 100 times the heights of each rectangle would be 20 plus 16 plus 18 plus 27. Um, I believe the way the problem is set up you can use either a left-hand or a right-hand Riemann sum, and you'll still be within the margin of error. Um, okay, questions about that problem? Kind of complicated. Okay, I got two minutes. I think I have time to do this last part. Question is, how much would the total cost increase if production were increased from 400 to 401 units? 400 to 401 units. Well, what we're really after here is C prime of 400. Okay. How much would the total cost increase if production were increased from 400 to 401 units? Well, it's just going to be the change in the variable cost from 400 to 401 because the fixed cost isn't changing. So we just got to consider how much does it cost for us to produce the 401st item. And that's going to be the marginal cost evaluated at 400. Okay, That's telling us how fast is the cost increasing at that point. Okay, so for example, if we looked at a graph of C, and it looks like this, and let's say here's 400, and here's 401. What we look at, if we want to know what is the change in cost from this point to this point, then what we can do is consider we know that this is 1 and we know that the rate at which we are increasing the slope of this gray path tangent line that's C prime of 400 
And the C prime of 400 tells us how much should we rise if we move over one unit. So if we move over one unit and we follow this tangent line, we're going to be pretty close to the actual uh, to the actual orange point, which we're sort of interested in. And what we're really interested in, actually, is the distance, this green distance here. So if we instead measure this pink distance here, it's going to be pretty close, is basically the idea. So we look at the marginal cost of 400, and we can read that straight from, straight from here. It should be 27. Okay, just got that straight from the table. All right, uh, any further questions about this problem? Kind of a doozy of a problem, really. Okay, um, well, if you have further questions, don't forget I have office hours today. I'm gonna start at 11 and I will go until either people are done or until I have to go for my seminar at 2.30. So extra long office hours today, show up, study, exam on Monday. Have a good weekend. Yep, you too. Mm -hmm. Alice, did you have any lingering questions? Uh, no, no, no. Okay.